Well, there's a cookbook formula for this as well. It would be, it would be good to understand why this works, but the formula here, this is what they mean when they tell you to find the average of a function on an interval. Here's how we find the average of a function on an interval. So we can try to apply that to number 24. Is there an, uh, another equation for like, um, I know there's average value, but there's another one that's like uh, average. I think this is the basic formula you're likely to need for uh, averages. I'm not thinking of another oh, formula really? right now. Okay. Yeah. Wait, can you um, explain that? Uh, it'll probably make more sense if we try to uh, do this example with it. But if they ask you for the average of a function from a lower bound to an upper bound, you just plug into this formula to figure that out. It's 1 over the upper bound minus the lower bound <coughs> times the integral of the function integrated from the lower bound to the upper bound. But it'll be easier to see how the function works if we try to apply it to number 24. So what should I plug in for b minus a for number 24? Um, pi minus 0? Yeah. Notice that b minus a is just the length of the interval. This is just the length of the interval. That might be another way that the formula is written, with the length of the interval. Uh, so what should be our, my lower bound of integration? And the upper bound is pi. And what should we plug in for f of x? Cosine x minus x. Okay, so let's work through that. Uh, so hopefully now it's, uh, it's uh, easier to understand what this formula means. So this is an example of how to use this formula. Will we use a substitution and make sine x or u? Sounds good, yeah. Oh, I forgot the exponent. Oh, still doesn't matter. Huh? Uh, maybe you're right. Okay. Now you might be right. All right. So um, the substitution method is a good method here because you can substitute u equals sine of x, and its derivative is also in the integral, cosine. So the cosine dx term is going to cancel, is going to drop out, and we're going to be left with u to the four times du. Um, I think the method you were used is okay, uh, but we can check it using a different method. When we change the variable, we change our, our, our uh, numbers of integration over here. These represented x's, and these represent u's. Well, when x is 0, what should u be? If x is 0, what should u be? Right. 
So these are supposed to represent x's, but when we change the variable of integration to u, these have to represent u's. But when x is 0, u would also be 0. How about when x is pi? Also 0. Huh, yeah. So, yeah. so actually, we don't have to do any more work. You don't even have to take this antiderivative, because the integral of anything from 0 to 0 is 0. So what must be happening here? Uh, why'd you put it 0 and 0? Well, here, what we, our variable of integration was x. So we were thinking of x moving from 0 to pi. Mm -hmm. But when we use the substitution method, we're changing our variable of integration. The variable is changing from x to u. So, instead of, um, so now we can't use the numbers that represent what x is moving between. We have to use numbers that represent what u is moving between. Well, when x is 0, u would also be 0. We can see that from our definition of u. Sine of 0 is 0. And when x is pi, at the upper limit of integration, u would be 0 there as well, because the sine of pi is 0. So moving x from 0 to pi is the same as moving, zero, as, is the same as moving u from 0 to 0. This is kind of a weird problem. You, you usually don't end up with the variables of integration being the same number. Uh, but uh, the method still works, even when they do happen to turn out to be the same number. So the key thing is, if you use the substitution method for a definite integral, um, when you change from x to u, you also have to change your limits of integration from numbers that represent x to numbers that represent u. So how do you change the limits of integration? Well, this represents x, and you would plug that into this formula to figure out what u corresponds to that. And that would give us this number down here. And this number represents the top limit for x, so you would plug that into this formula to figure out the top limit for u. You could also do it the way you did, which is, um, uh, get rid of u at the end and put, put things back in terms of x. Um, the way they do it in the book is like this. For me, this is a little bit simpler, but uh, maybe not for everybody. But we got the same answer both ways. So the, the only problem with the way you did it is that you were forced to write down things that weren't true in, in part of your work. You were still writing this, even though a TA could say this isn't true anymore. So it's really probably safer to change your limits of integration. So a lot of people kind of just ignore this little d in the, in the, in the, in the integration. But this is actually important. This tells us what variable the limits of integration are referring to. Well, when we change the little d, we have to change these numbers here as well. OK, so so the uh, equation must look something like this. I don't know what the exact formula is. But this must be what the, uh, what the, the, uh, the function looks like. It must be, uh, half of the time it must be positive between 0 and pi, and half the time it must be negative. So the average value is 0. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. We can do one more problem if you like. Um, can we do number 15? I'm sorry, number 16. I'm sorry, number 11. I'm sorry, which one? Number 11. Number 11. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, so one of the things that we should have been doing today is learning what you need in your cheat sheet. So we've come up with a bunch of things you need in the cheat sheet. One thing you need is this formula for finding uh, the average of a function.